On this week's edition of New York Now, back to business. Regions will have to meet a series of new standards to start reopening their economy, including a boost in COVID-19 testing. Nobody says you're going to eliminate the virus in the short term. Nobody. That puts pressure on counties, which already have some tough choices to make that could affect your tax bill. Dutchess County Executive Mark Molinaro joins me to explain. Some businesses in New York State could reopen as soon as next weekend, but there's a long road ahead. Heather Bruschetti from the Business Council of New York State joins us with her perspective. And two neighborhoods in Queens had very different experiences with the coronavirus. Reporter Josefa Velasquez from the city joins me with the details. I'm Dan Clark, and this is New York Now. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark from the state capitol. We now know what each region has to do to start reopening businesses, and it's not going to be easy. Governor Andrew Cuomo laid out a new set of requirements this week for each region to meet before they're allowed to reopen. Not only will they have to see a decline in the number of hospitalizations and deaths, they also have to increase the number of tests available and be able to map out who each patient may have infected. Cuomo said those metrics will prepare regions for another surge of the disease. When you look at this state, there are some regions that right now, by the numbers, pose a lower risk, some that pose a higher risk. So they're getting all that import, all those specifics, all that data, and then day by day, they're making a decision as to how to proceed with reopening based on the data, based on the facts. As of Monday, no region had met Cuomo's standards to reopen, and some county leaders are saying that's going to be a hard standard to meet. We'll more on that later with Dutchess County Executive Mark Molinaro. But first, Josefa Velasquez from the nonprofit news organization The City is here with me to talk about this great story she had this week. Josefa, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So you had this great story. We're going to get to the news of the week in just a little bit, but let's talk about your two neighborhood story, as we have been calling it. What it is, is you looked at two neighborhoods in the borough of Queens, which our viewers know is really where the coronavirus had a major outbreak at the start of this, and it's continued into now. We're looking at Flushing and Corona Queens, which for people, it's, it, you know, it, it, the name didn't come from coronavirus. The neighborhood was named Corona far before this disease ever came along. So. From what I understand, they had very different experiences with the disease, but they're really similar neighborhoods. Do I have that right in terms of their demographics or I guess socioeconomical status? Yeah, so that's right. Where you look at two neighborhoods that neighbor each other, one of them being Corona that is predominantly Latino and the other one being Flushing, which is predominantly Asian. And they have very similar socioeconomic status. They have very similar rates of people who don't have insurance. They have very similar uh, groups of people that are in the quote unquote service industry. So we're talking about uh, cleaners, delivery drivers, uh, people that work in transportation. And it's really night and day in terms of how they both experience uh, this COVID outbreak. And just goes to show how much preparation really plays into all of this and the outcomes. Um, it's not that Corona Queens did anything wrong or its residents did anything wrong. It's just that Flushing, the people in Flushing were really prepared for this outbreak, seeing the news from uh, China and having family from back there telling them to take this seriously. So by mid-February, you already saw supermarkets implementing things that we're seeing now where it's like socially distancing people, having masks, having the plexiglass uh, by the uh, cash register. And those small steps really did take a huge strain off of what could have been, you know, a bigger outbreak in that area. Um, but also it just goes to show that in those like two weeks where state and the city were sort of hemming and hawing as to what to do, that was really critical in figuring out the outcomes. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but these neighborhoods essentially, uh, not the neighborhood of Flushing, essentially did what the state and the city were going to order them to do earlier, and that prevented more of an outbreak and more of a spread. Is that kind of what I'm understanding? And I think it's really interesting that the grocery stores specifically decided as, and I think you said it was 20 grocery stores in the story or some crazy amount, they all decided to just 
closed because they knew if they kept it open, these are congregate places that people would flock to and the disease would just spread. Right. And I think that's what's so amazing in all this, that grocery stores are considered an essential business. They're allowed to remain open, but there are also these areas where people are getting their only social interaction by going to the grocery store. And in Flushing, you had Chinese grocery stores in unison close on one day and, just, and decide, it wasn't a decision that was made by the grocery store owners. It was their employees that said, we're not coming to work. We're scared we're gonna get sick. This isn't worth it. And the grocery store owner said, okay. And it just goes to show what a community can do when it binds together like that, where you didn't have one grocery store saying, okay, we're not gonna shut down, You know, screw everyone, we're gonna keep going. They all did it at the same time. So before I let you go, let's touch on some of the news of the week. Probably the biggest headline later in the week is the governor is extending an eviction waiver. So commercial and residential tenants in New York City and across the state, if they don't pay rent between now and theoretically between what was in March and August 20th, landlords can evict them. Um, what does this mean for tenants, Josefa? Are, are people having a hard time paying rent right now with all the unemployment issues? And is this a big reprieve for them? And also, what does it mean for landlords? Do we know? So it is a reprieve in the short term. It's a short-term solution for a long-term problem. There's people now who haven't been able to pay their rent for the month of April, for the month of May. And the big open-ended question is what happens when this is lifted? Is everyone on the hook for three, four months of rent all at once? Um, and that's something that the governor said today, we'll deal with that issue when we come to it. It's hard to predict what will occur in two to three months from now. Um, and for landlords, I mean, there are landlords who say, hey, we have to pay too. It's, they have mortgages on these properties. It's a domino effect as to what happens. You have some places that maybe they don't have a mortgage on their facility, some places do. Um, and so if a tenant doesn't pay rent, maybe that means the landlord doesn't pay their mortgage, then their credit report, like credit scores go down. It's It could have like a trickle effect on the economy. It's just a multifaceted uh, issue. All right, well, we will leave it there. Josefa, thanks so much for uh, you know talking to us this week, and thank you for all of your work with all your journalism, being here at the briefings when the governor actually shows up to Albany, and all the stories that you're putting out on a weekly and daily basis. We really appreciate everything you're doing. Thanks for coming on New York Now this week. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoy being on. Now onto some other news from the week. Counties in New York are projecting more than $3 billion in lost revenue because of the coronavirus, and they're already working overtime to respond to the disease. Out in Western New York, Erie County Executive Mark Polonkar said this week that if they don't get money from the federal government, they'll be looking at cuts in their county budget. We must have a stimulus package 4.0. If we don't have a stimulus package 4.0, we're gonna to have to do drastic cuts across all county departments. We cannot continue this forever. So uh, we, are, uh, we are planning on a potential layoff. There's also this question of how much control counties have in meeting those standards set by Cuomo to reopen the economy. Without sales tax, counties are losing a major source of their revenue, and there's also the possibility of spending cuts from the state. All of that affects your tax bill. County leaders are now asking for help to offset their financial troubles. Dutchess County Executive Mark Molinaro joined me via Skype. Dutchess County Executive Mark Molinaro, thanks so much for joining us here on New York Now this week. I'm glad to be with you virtually. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> So, Mark, I want to start with the governor's new plan this week for reopening the economy. He put out these kind of seven metrics for regions of the state to meet. Obviously, you're just a county executive. I don't want to say just a county executive, but nice. you don't control a whole region, I should say. Um, am I right that county leaders like yourself will kind of be involved in making sure that some of these metrics are met? Or am I wrong there? And how do counties hit those targets when you have so much pressure on you already during this COVID-19 crisis? Listen, county governments actually are the front line of the response. I mean, it is our health departments uh, functioning at uh, really the behest, if you will, of, of the State Department of Health. So, you know, we're the ones setting up the test sites. We're the ones working with the private sector uh, to make sure that there's access to testing. We're the ones that will manage some of the contact tracing. So uh, I'll offer to you that, you know, we're very much the point of contact uh, in trying to attain those, those expectations. This is what I've said to people, you know, what we know today is bound to change tomorrow, seven, and it's not a criticism, 
the, 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 the framework the governor has offered is likely the framework that within it will have some variance. Uh, there's no region in New York that meets all those expectations today. I will tell you, Dutchess County is moving and trending in the right direction. Uh, and you know this, uh, we've talked about this, the, the Hudson Valley region or the Mid-Hudson region includes Westchester and Rockland. And even the governor publicly says uh, it's Westchester, Rockland South, and then rest of state. In fact, there was a slide that, set, that called us rest of state. So from our perspective, uh, we think that the Hudson Valley region needs to be considered um, apart from Westchester and Rockland, uh, Dutchess, Ulster, and Orange are working together. We have been for, for months now. Uh, and we're going to be including uh, in our next round of collaboration, uh, Sullivan, Putnam, uh, Green, and Columbia counties. And together, uh, we're going to, listen, our goal is to protect lives while also working aggressively to get people back to living their lives. And and so we'll, we'll, we're gonna work within the framework. We're gonna push up against it responsibly. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, we expect to be a part of the decision-making. We're the ones on the ground acting as the front line and the lifeline in many cases for the state. And just for our viewers that aren't familiar with the context of what you're saying, Westchester and Rockland are really where, I don't want to say it started, but Westchester certainly had that huge cluster at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic here in New York. And Dutchess yeah. is, you know, just a, a stone's throw away, but obviously you haven't had the same experience of them. You, you've had more of an experience that we see in like Greene County and... Um, Ulster County, you know, your nearby neighbors yeah. there. So you know, well, we say the impact in Dutchess is 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 less than Westchester Rockland, and it's greater than north of us, which is why the regional approach always made sense. And our expectation is that we need to be considered in that region, and re Westchester Rockland, for real real reasons, need to be considered uh, because of the data. Our data suggests that we're slightly different than they are. So let's talk about property taxes, because you are one of the few county executives in the state that I know of that have been able to, and this is an anomaly, been able to either hold the line on property taxes or, uh, you know, keep your property tax increase levy, whatever you want to call it, very, very yeah. low. But now this year, we have this enormous problem where counties are not getting the revenue that they need to sustain their budgets. The state might be making cuts to counties and local governments. How do you consolidate that? How do you plan with with your um, spending going forward? And how does that affect your, affect your taxpayers that have been kind of relying on you over the past couple of years to keep their taxes at bay? Well, first, uh, you know, that's correct. Dutchess actually, uh, uh, six of the last seven years has cut its property tax levy, uh, largest tax levy in 20 years we gave this year. Um, we also, though, have built up our fund balance. So for the rainy day, we've been preparing, and it is raining. That said, uh, the pandemic and the closure of activity uh, is likely to result in as much as a $75 million reduction in revenue. That's that's 200 jobs in county government. So from our perspective, uh, the challenge is real right now. And what we've said is, uh, listen, the state budget adopted by the legislature already shifted costs to county governments. In my case, uh, $1.5 million in new expenditures, new costs, just from the budget alone. Uh, we, we're hopeful that the state doesn't attempt to balance its losses on the backs of local government, because frankly, we're out there doing the work the state needs us. Right. So this is twofold. We're planning, we're preparing, we're reacting, and we're taking the steps necessary to insulate our taxpayers and, and, and preserve the services that, is, that are expected of us. At the same time, we're advocating for aid. We agree the states and, and, and counties deserve and need federal assistance to weather the storm. And I'm hopeful that people will put apart, put aside the partisanship and summon the political courage and the necessity for the federal government to assist counties directly. Uh, we, you know, we administer 1,900 pu uh, public health departments across the country, 1,000 hospitals are county owned across the country. So, so that loss of revenue is, is really a threat to our ability to provide the, the response that the president, Congress, and governors expect. Uh, we need that aid, we need that assistance and at the same time, we're going to have to make some tough choices, but we're going to be honest with people. We're going to be forthright about it. And we're going to be very clear as to what we expect we can and cannot achieve this year. But there's going to be a lot of uh, reining in uh, to the extent we can. And, and uh, we're going to have to consider some significant cuts. What does that look like for your community when, when you go to look at what, how it trickles down to maybe cuts or holding spending back? What does that look like? Should we expect um, you know, taxes to go up maybe or uh, maybe some restraint from schools in terms of their spending, things like that? What are you looking at when you're trying to plan out your well, spending? And well, you know, I'll say this. This is uh, the governor's talk about reimagining. This is one of those times where reimagining the formulas and the relationship between state and local, state and school district makes a lot of sense. There are certain mandates that cause us to spend money. 
give us a little latitude here. Uh, re- let us reduce staff at jails when our population, inmate population is significantly lower. Give us the tools to restrict spending and then see where we are. That's number one. The state should do that. The governor should give us that latitude. And I promise we can deliver services at a more effective and more efficient way than we do today. But again, for Dutch, this this could be as much as a $75 million cut or, or loss in services uh, and revenue. So uh, what that means for us is we have to consider downsizing the workforce. We have to consider restricting a certain uh, core services and, and limiting those expenditures. And we we come to taxes last. We don't balance the budget on the backs of taxpayers first. We, we sort of end there. And so from our position, we will cut and we will restrain and we will fight for the relief from the federal government. And then we'll make some decisions. Now, the good news for Dutchess County is we just we just released our annual uh, report. We ended last year with a surplus, a uh, million dollar surplus. We expanded our rainy day fund. And so we're going to draw down on those resources, insulate and, and sort of buffer our taxpayers. But we're not going to be able to protect them entirely, certainly not without state, uh, excuse me, without federal aid. And I really, again, would encourage the state, give us latitude so they know they, they no more have to balance their problems on our backs uh, then we would have to cut simply because we can't get out from some of the very restrictive mandates. What's your biggest need right now? I feel like when people hear that you're looking for money from the federal government, they they think, you know, obviously you need the money, but maybe they don't know what you're going to spend it on. Where would that yeah. money go? What, where do you see it going? Uh, the the exp- so, so in this moment, public health departments uh, responding to the cases, uh, managing uh, the response to the disease, uh, uh, providing the support uh, to businesses and others, PPE, uh, we're going to continue to buy and distribute to, to, to employers and to frontline staff and to essential staff. The, the county sheriff's office and law enforcement, the 911 dispatchers, uh, those services uh, at social service that provide support for families and individuals uh, in need, child protective services. I mean, honestly, there, there are very core services that county governments provide that are at this moment critically essential. I mean, just critically essential that we have to sustain. And so this isn't about asking for a handout. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a lifeline. Uh, and again, we understand that that uh, the federal government can't can't, ba- can't can't provide us everything we need, but there needs to be a direct line of revenue and aid uh, to county governments across the country so that we can continue to do the work that's expected of us and our taxpayers and residents need us to do in responding to this crisis. All right. Well, we will leave it there. Dutchess County Executive Mark Molinaro, thanks so much for joining us here in New York. Now, always great to hear from you. Same same here. Stay safe and be well. In other news, Governor Cuomo said this week that each region will reopen in four phases. Each phase will have different industries. It's likely that some industries in some regions won't reopen for weeks, if not months. Well, which businesses do we open first? You open businesses first that are most essential and pose the lowest risk. The first phase will be construction, manufacturing, and some retail with curbside pickup. The second phase is professional services and real estate. After that, it's restaurants and hotels. Arts and entertainment are last. We wanted to know how all of this will work for businesses, so we asked Heather Bruschetti from the State Business Council. Karen DeWitt has that interview. Heather Bruschetti, thanks for joining us. It's nice to see you again, if virtually. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Now, as head of the Business Council, you lobby on behalf of a lot of small businesses, chambers of commerce, but also large manufacturing companies. Some of the major upstate manufacturers are part of your group. I guess I want to ask, first of all, just how are your members doing? Well, you know, it varies, of course, depending on whether or not they're essential or non-essential. I think, you know, the one common factor that they all have is that they are all feeling very ready to get back to work. And I think, you know, most of them are in the process of trying to develop plans to to get there. Yeah, the governor um, this week is listing all the reopening criteria that needs to be gone through. And some regions of the state who have lower levels of the virus will be able to reopen. But I have to say, after listening to him, they seem really arduous for both individuals and for businesses. I mean, what he said is that businesses will essentially have to reimagine their whole setup, their design to have social distancing, to have enough masks. And I think a concern for you would be to make enough money to keep afloat and be able to keep employing people. So what are some of the manufacturers thinking about? What are some examples of things they would have to do differently? Well, and so I'll start off by saying, you know, most employers um, already have some 
set protocol for how they operate and deal with things like OSHA standards and practices. So this isn't an entirely new world for them. Uh, it's just more and in and, and some ways different. But um, I'll give you examples. I mean, we have manufacturers who are suggesting that instead of having their shifts, shifts overlap, uh, they'll have a break between between shifts and come in and you know sterilize and clean um, whatever uh, the, wherever they change the clothes or uh, where people enter and exit and that kind of thing. And but I can tell you this: every single one of them is is thinking about putting together a plan and how it will work um, given their unique operations. Um, so it's not it's not unusual for businesses to have operating plans. This is just sort of a bigger um, bigger version of that. Now, do businesses have to get approval from the state for these plans before they're allowed to reopen? And how is that going to work? Well, so that's a great question. And we've been talking to the governor's uh, recover the, the reopen New York team, and I, I'm, I'm misnaming it there. But um, I know what you so mean. as yeah, as I understand it, um, there will be basically an industry template or protocol for how the reopening will occur. And then individual businesses will modify it based on their um, particular operations. Modify in a way that does not in any way lessen uh, the safety features. So um, just for example, uh, if, if you say, if, let's say you have a common uh, area where people hang their coats, they would have to maybe accommodate that and figure out um, do people go in there all at once or not? But that might not be part of the overall industry protocol because it depends on the configuration of the individual business. They will have to develop individualized plans, um, but the individualized plans I don't think require specific approval. We're clarifying that. As I understand it, they would keep that on file um, demonstrating that it does accomplish the objectives. Yeah, and so you could, a business could be more strict with these regulations, but can't be less strict with them is the idea, right? Yes, correct. Now, as I mentioned, um, your main job is to lobby for the interests of the business in the state. And um, I'm wondering if there's things that you would like state government to do. I know we've heard some from some businesses saying, could you postpone? you know, the sales tax that we have to pay or some of the property tax dates because, you know, we, we're not, we don't have any revenue. We don't have the money to pay them. Are you seeking things like that or other things that would, you know, help businesses stay afloat? Well, I mean, certainly uh, the state did early on have some accommodations require, you know, regarding the payment of sales tax installments, for example. I mean, I think as this continues, uh, we may be seeking some additional relief. Um, certainly, we're going to be asking for consideration of things like um, liability. And if, if, for example, someone was manufacturing something on an emergency basis, uh, we don't want to see them take on additional liability as a result of that. Uh, there's, so there's going to be a lot. There's a lot of working, you know, moving parts here as we move forward. Um, but first and foremost, I think um, being able to get up and open and operate in a safe way is probably the number one priority. Yeah, and it's going to be a long haul. I mean, what do you expect over the next year? Not that anybody knows what to expect, but... I don't want to depress anyone. I mean, I, I think that if we do this smart, we may only have to go through this once. That would be nice. Um, I, I don't think that we're going to be fully unwound from restrictions, and we may be dealing with some permanent changes, and I and I don't think that would be a huge surprise to anyone. But until there's a vaccine, um, I think certain sectors, it's going to be much harder for them to get back and operate. And so it's very important that our members, for example, those in gaming or entertainment, that they come up with the ideas that they have, because frankly, some of the ideas we've seen are very creative, um, very innovative as far as how you could reopen a facility, um, whether it be how many people you let into a space at once, how far apart they sit, or whether you have sections for people who have, you know, already gotten the vaccine or have the antibody. So a lot of this depends on science and we need to follow the science. I'm also wondering if some businesses are discovering through this pandemic that there's some practices maybe they can let go of that were maybe outdated that they didn't even know about and there might be some better ways to go forward. I mean, the, the number one thing I've heard there 
is that people are recognizing that they may not need the amount of office space that they have. Now that may, there, there may be the counterbalance to that is that no one can sit as close as they used to. So you might still need all the space that you had, but um, certainly the ability to work from home um, is something that I think the vast majority of my employers who do have people working from home would say, we didn't think it would be this effective and this easy to transition to work from home. All right, well, we'll have to leave it there. We'll be following this as everyone will over the next year, possibly more. Thanks very much for taking the time to join us. Thank, thank you very much for having me. We have more coverage of that issue and more every day over on our website at nynow.org. And don't forget to follow us over on social media at nynow underscore PBS. Until then, I'm Dan Clark. Thanks for watching this week's edition of New York Now. Have a great week and be well. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET.